Hello, hello, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Circuit Streams HoloLens Space Invaders Workshop and Webinar. Total classic for you today. Super excited to have everybody in attendance. Uh, before I do proceed with the presentation, can anybody throw into the chat a thumbs up, a yes? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Please and thank you. Someone let me know. Thank you, Steph. Much appreciated. Um, before I kick off with the webinar too, I do want to just say welcome once again. A couple housekeeping items. Uh, you've all found your way to the chat tab, uh, just to the right of the screen there. At the top of that chat tab, there is a questions tab and a polls tab. These are both important for us throughout the audience, or throughout the presentation rather, uh, to keep track of as well. If you do have a question, I would ask that you paste it into the questions tab. Uh, we like to keep track of these things there so that they don't get lost. And at the end in the Q&A session, uh, we can get to all the questions. The polls tab, uh, periodically I am gonna be tossing in a poll just to gauge the, the interest and the attention of the audience, experience with Unity, device ownership, that type of thing. But what I'd love to leave these workshops off with is to better understand where everybody is tuning in from today. We're a Canadian company. We're headquartered in Calgary, Alberta. I myself am in Toronto, Ontario. I'd love to learn where everybody's tuning in from today. So please let me know in the chat. Uh, I know I see Steph and Dayan, they're both in Calgary. Zach, LA, welcome. The Gold Coast, or the, the that's funny. The West Coast is what I meant to say. Toronto, Vlad, nice to, uh, nice to see you. You know, Six God, I love that. Jacob from Texas, welcome. Sweden, Alberto, wow. Got some international folks here. Uh, good evening, Nadia. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are located internationally throughout the world, I do want to let you know we will be recording this workshop and webinar. It will automatically be sent to everyone. So if you do have to tune out for supper or for work or for anything else that might come up, don't worry. You are going to get the recording sent to you. So without further uh, ado, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going to be covered today. I'm going to take about 10 minutes here to introduce CircuitStream, talk a little bit about us. Um, Nikisa, my colleague who's backstage at the moment, is going to join. Oh, she's actually on the stage. Pardon me. I thought she was backstage. Um, she's going to take over and do a technical presentation for everybody in attendance today, talk a little bit about design for the HoloLens 2, Space Invaders, and so on. I'll jump back in once she's concluded her presentation to wrap things up, uh, and we will do an in-depth Q&A session at that point. Let's get it. So I've already mentioned this. My name is Kyle. I'm on the education team here at CircuitStream. I bring about three years of sports and technology experience uh, to the table. Fun fact that I like to share about myself uh, for those of you in attendance, by the way, who have been here before, you're probably a little bit tired of hearing this fact, but it's a cool story. I like to tell it anyways. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, cool fact, I am an NBA champion. Um, back before working with Circuit Stream, I had the pleasure to work with the Toronto Raptors and take part in their championship run in the 2019 season. No, I was not a player. I'm about two and a half feet too short to be an NBA player. I have no marketable skills or talent whatsoever on the basketball court, but I'm a champion anyways, so pretty cool. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, Nikisa. As you can see, Nikisa is an instructor and VR, AR developer here at CircuitStream. She teaches some of our courses as well. Chris, yes, I did get a ring. It's actually right over there on uh, on the shelf. Maybe I'll bring it out next, next workshop. Um, but Nikisa, she is definitely the resident HoloLens and Magic Leap expert at CircuitStream. Um, fun fact about her, maybe she can talk a little bit more about this during her part of the presentation as well. Nikisa used to be involved with a circus as well. So pretty cool stories there, but she can definitely speak to that one um, in just a few minutes here. Now, Circuit Stream, who are we? Uh, what, what are we all about? Well, we're a Canadian company founded in 2015, headquartered in Calgary, Alberta, there in the Western province uh, in Canada. We noticed a gap in the personalized and you know training and education space back then um, to date we've trained over 30,000 students to teach them how to help you know learn manage and build ar and vr experiences we're a team of about 20 experts coming together from all different backgrounds from all over the world as you can see to train and educate folks in the xr space 
CircuitStream is also a Unity certified training partner. Training partners are approved by Unity based on their expertise, their focus on quality education, and their commitment to providing the highest level of training available. We're also an official Unity channel partner, meaning that we partner to deliver training and application development services in the architecture, engineering, construction, automotive, transportation, and manufacturing markets. So what this means is that those who complete our courses do get our certificates of completion as well. CircuitStream really does three main things. The first is education and training. Uh, and these logos that you can see on the screen here are some of the organizations that we've had the pleasure of having in our programs. As you can see, we've worked with companies like the Vantage Airport Group, YouTube, Nike, Apple, Georgia Pacific, Hershey's The Chocolate Company, the list goes on and on. The XR development with Unity course is really the program that started it all. It's definitely our flagship product or service within the education and training side of our business. Um, I'm gonna speak a little bit more about this program later on this afternoon, but for now, just know that it includes 40 hours of live education taught over a 10 week time span and covers the fundamental best practices of developing VR and AR experiences using Unity. Our next cohort actually commences on the 1st of December and registration closes super soon, um, coming up next week on Tuesday. On the right of the screen, you'll see the XR Project Accelerator course. This is a course that we've more recently launched for the folks in the room who don't necessarily need to learn the fundamentals of C-sharp programming or Unity itself, but rather it's for an intermediate or advanced audience. We've taken everything that we've learned about online education, and here we've created a project-driven program designed to help accelerate what you're already working on while continuing to learn more advanced best practices via the weekly labs. We've also launched some individual shorter courses covering specific topics in XR development, XR design, and art. Uh, we're also doing some device-specific courses too. These courses vary from one to six weeks and are all taught live and online, just like the XR Development with Unity course and the XR Project Accelerator course. Here's a list of all the new individual courses that I just mentioned. Uh, these all launch in January and we're super excited to be expanding our catalog of academic offerings. Please note as well, and this is super exciting, uh, we officially kicked off our Black Friday sale offerings today. Uh, we do have two amazing bundles uh, and one flat discount across all of our products. Uh, more on this later in my presentation, but I just want to let everyone know in attendance, if you're interested in any of what I just mentioned, um, definitely take advantage of this deal. It's here until I believe November the 30th. Definitely includes our 10 week course. Um, and you know, you might be able to get a free Oculus headset as well. Wait and see. One of the things that really differentiates our training and education programs is the one-to-one -one support that's included. Uh, I've already mentioned this in the 10 and eight week courses. Uh, but each student gets dedicated appointments every week to work on their project with an, ins an instructor, pardon me, just like Nikisa. So the idea here is not only are you everything that we think XR developers should know, but we'll help you bring your idea for a VR or AR experience to life as well. Now, I mentioned there's three things that we do. This is the second thing. We're also a professional content creation agency meaning that we can help you by building the training content that you'd like to bring back to your organization. We'll consult with you to better understand your employee training as it exists today and to identify any barriers to success that might exist. Finally, we'll work with your internal stakeholders to create immersive experiences that meet and exceed your KPIs. Alongside training education uh, and content creation, the CircuitStream platform is a cloud-based portal that we launched late in 2019. It's designed to help organizations host and scale their XR training content. Additionally, it allows organizations to easily track and analyze learning activities in VR. Awesome. Now that I've chatted a little bit about us, let's cover why everyone is here this afternoon. What are you going to learn? Uh, so today we're going to talk about the HoloLens 2 specifically. So we're going to cover the details on the functionality of hand gestures in augmented reality. We're going to talk about how to use these hand gestures in game design specifically. And we're going to talk about random object generation as well, which is pretty exciting. So Unity, uh, I've mentioned this a couple times already. 
For the beginners in the room who are unfamiliar with this program, I do want to talk about it just a little bit before passing things off to Nikisa. Before I do though, this is the first time that I'm gonna to toss a poll into the, um, into the chat. So head up to the top of the chat window there and navigate to the polls section. Give me just a second. I'm curious to know how much experience do you have on a scale of one to 10 in Unity? Always love posting this poll just to see what we get. So if you don't mind, just go have a look there. Uh, looks like we've got some beginners in the room today, mostly beginners here. Any any sevens, any tens? What, oh, one six there, we're coming back, we're coming back. Seven, okay, okay. Okay, it looks like we've got a pretty beginner room here today. Um, so for those of you who said zero, what is Unity? Unity is a free 3D development engine uh, for building games, simulations, experiences in 3D. It's the easiest way to begin making apps for XR, which if you're unfamiliar is just a umbrella term that describes virtual, mixed and augmented reality. So now that we know what Unity is, how do you actually go about creating VR and AR content within Unity? Just like most things, it all starts with an idea, the light bulb there. Then you have to design, develop, and build your application within an engine just like Unity. That idea gets pushed out through what's called an SDK, which stands for a software developer kit. And then ultimately it's rendered and hosted on the relevant devices that you've built for. Just on the bottom there, you can see the HoloLens and that's what we're gonna be building for today. So without further ado, today is an intro to HoloLens Space Invaders. Uh, I'd like to invite Nikisa up here to take over on the virtual stage. Uh, I can't express how lucky we are to have Nikisa join today. She really is an incredible developer and teacher. Also, her puns are pretty legendary. So maybe, just maybe, she'll bless us with a few of those uh, today. So take it away, Nikisa, all yours. Well, thank you, thank you. Well, now I've been scolded with my puns um, before and people tell me that I'm not supposed to say dad jokes if I'm not a dag because apparently that's a faux pas. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So, anyways, before we begin, I'll just explain. <laughs> I will just explain uh, what Kyle has mentioned on before. You design and then develop. So, part of this talk is going to be about designing for the Hollow Hems because it is quite quite a different device that we have to get used to. So. Yes, I was just about to present. So without further ado, let's get into, let's dive into the design portion of things. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be designing for the HoloLens. And the thing that you have to understand about the HoloLens, this lovely headset right here, is that um, this HoloLens, this device is, is just as much of uh, an idea as it is a product. So in order to make it work, you have to learn, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of different lessons that you have to learn here, like what if it's strengths, what if it's weaknesses, um, and, and what makes it great. So when you are designing for the, the HoloLens device, um, you really have to understand uh, how color is sort of perceived, um, what spatial awareness really is, what this device can actually do and what it's capable of so that you can build your, your apps and really help make this device shine. So one of the things that we have to, we have to think about with the HoloLens device uh, or designing and developing for this thing um, is it's, it's just kind of like um, building a plane as we're flying it type thing. And the thing that you really, really, really have to wrap your brain around is the fact that it's an entirely different beast. How do we know this? Because it is not like your PC or a Mac. Now with a PC or a Mac, they have their differences, but they are pretty similar. You know, They have a computer, they have a flat, flat screen, and um, how you design for these things is, is quite similar in the same, and it's pretty easy to understand that too. And the same way that we have the Android and the iPhone, these two platforms are very similar, even though that they reimagine different elements like plane detection in, or, or augmented reality uh, capabilities. So in the way that you think about like 
an Alexa or, or an Apple Watch. These two devices are different animals. And they have, you, you are required to think of new ways to design for these two things because what makes an Alexa good is different from what makes a smartwatch good. And then we have the HoloLens. <laughs> the HoloLens came out and it is totally new. It takes some elements from different platforms that we've seen before. Um, and you can kind of see bits and pieces of these devices in in um, some some ways here. But in t it, so far, this device is an entirely revolutionary and kind of like kind of far out there because we don't quite understand the idiosyncrasies and of a, a head mounted AR device. And like AR head mounted devices are still a new thing that are being invented. So we really need to dig into those differences. So in those differences, we have to respect them because there are a lot, there are a lot, a lot. Um, and because there are a lot of differences, we, we run the risk of, of getting lost in that. Um, but we need to leverage those things if we we're to make an app that really showcases the HoloLens and what it can do. Because it differentiates itself from you know, a, a smartphone that uh, has its AR uh, capabilities here. But even so, if this is just, you're holding this up and you're, you're holding it up with one hand and then you have your other hand that's sort of doing whatever, it's touching on the screen or it's waving around in, in the space before it. So those are two very stark differences of two different devices and we have to leverage those things. Making sense? Ah, good question, Zachary. The field of view for the HoloLens 2 is, is, I would actually say it's comparable to a Magic Leap. Now, the differences in these two devices, if the field of view is actually quite similar, is the onboard sensors for these two things. And I'll dive into that a little bit later on because the, the, the HoloLens 2 is really all about, it's, it's hand tracking and a whole bunch of different things. But I'll get into that. So hold your horses. So when we are testing and designing on this HoloLens stuff, in a practical sense, you have to be using the device. There is no substitute for this device. You have to put it on and you have to see what everything is working. Now, because you have to test things, and, and as an experienced sort of HoloLens uh, AR developer, um, <laughs> cannot emphasize, emphasize this enough, there is, you, you have to test your designs on it. There is a lot of uh, instances where I've uh, come up with a design, threw it on the HoloLens, see how it works, and I was like, nope, does not work, redo, everything. Uh, so, and that's just like part of the learning process that you have to do. But also on the flip side, like if you've ever worked on an embedded device before, you know that it can be a pain. And it's just like any sort of uh, cutting edge technology, the HoloLens can be rough sometimes. Like, why isn't my sensor being found? Why doesn't this compile? Why isn't this deploying to device? So because of that, you really want to fine tune and tweak in the Unity editor to iterate quickly. There's a number of ways that you can do this. One is uh, using your HoloLens emulator, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. And two is um, you can actually use the editor itself. Uh, but when you're using the editor, there is a very, very big, big thing about the HoloLens device, and that's, in, and that's how it understands the environment in this thing called spatial mapping. Dive into that a little bit later on. So the HoloLens is really all about its sensors. It's this amazing piece of technology as far as awareness of the world goes, that spatial mapping. So this is such a key piece of AR because AR is really all about understanding the real, real world and placing computing on top of that. And the HoloLens 2 is really the best of its class in that sense. So it's important to think about all the onboard sensors that the HoloLens offers you and to build around those capabilities. Like no other, AR device um, has the millimeter precision 
as the HoloLens, like in terms of location, in terms of what you're looking at, where the world is, or, or where a plane is, where a table is, where a fridge is, where doors are. I mean, the, not even the Magic Leap has that millimeter size, precise, or precision that we have. So the other thing that you can use here is you can also use like Vuforia QR codes. You can use image tracking as well. Like maybe you're using a little coaster here for an elephant in the room. Ha. And, and now because you're using these, or these, these image tracking, you now have something that almost functions like a, uh, a what's it called? Controller for VR. Uh, and then that way you can you can design around that. So you you can do tangible physical things that even smartphones can't do. Like even though your iPhone depth camera doesn't, it it doesn't understand the world in the same way that the HoloLens does. So you have to give it the same sort of integrated experience that the full sensor sensor sweep of this HoloLens device provides you. So one of the most impressive sensors that the HoloLens has to offer is your hands. Now, when it comes to hand tracking, the HoloLens is really best of its class. It has fully articulated hand tracking where you know everywhere, every single joint is to a very precise degree. And focusing on hand tracking is really going to be a key part to making a good HoloLens app. It's also one of the ways that this technology differentiates itself from all other technologies because even with a smartphone that has a pretty good hand recognition system, you're still fundamentally you know, holding your phone up with one hand, waving your hand around like Wingardium Leviosa, but not quite because it's not as immersive as a headset. So when you're designing these apps, start with your hands first, because not only is it the most intu intuitive way that humans can interact with the world, it's sort of a dream come true when you can reach out and touch virtual constructs. So that being said, it's important to understand that the sensor suite enables humans to integrate their intentions and desires and their bodies into the computational world. But that also means that there are a lot of people with the inability to integrate. My body and how it moves and, and interacts with things is different from everyone else's. There's only one Nikisa that can Nikisa like Nikisa does. <laughs> and only one Kyle that can Kyle the way that Kyle does. So it's important to understand that this might also be an accessibility issue. Because what if I have, I don't know, five fingers instead of 10? Ooh, <laughs> or my thumb was broken. Um, so, so what does that mean if, if I only have hands integration in my HoloLens app? Or, or what if for the eye tracking that um, I have a stigmata in, in one of my eyes, so that means my eyes don't converge the way that normal eyes do. So as technology gets more advanced and more capable of understanding ourselves and our bodies and the world, there are more exceptions to its ability to understand that. If the only way for us to interact with a computer is with a mouse, then you can move this mouse with any part of your body, right? So I can substitute a mouse with a joystick maybe, or, or an eye tracker, or um, all these different ways that people can adapt themselves to computing. So with the increased sensor fidelity on the HoloLens, it's getting harder and harder for people to adapt themselves to computing. So what that means is that computing needs to be more willing to adapt itself to people. So that might mean that I have something in my hands um, the, so I can't use like hand tracking, like maybe I am really, really hungry and I have a burrito and I'm um, in a um, BMW mechanic shop and I have a throw on this HoloLens and I'm still like checking out all the things, right? And I say, show me the axles. Oh, <laughs> I don't know about cars. <laughs> Is the history of cars, if there's a book about a history of a car, would that be an auto biography? <laughs> Anyways, so if I have like something in my hands and I'm using hand tracking, well then what am I, what am I supposed to do with the other sensor suite? Uh, how am I supposed to adapt myself to uh, whatever the app is doing? Or, or maybe I'm wearing gloves. 
uh, and the tracker can't pick up on my IR transparency or, or if it's IR opaque. Uh, so it's important to use the other sensors. So you want to use voice, you want to use eyes, you want to use um, GGV, which is uh, gaze, gesture, and voice. Like um, if you want to use your voice, and you can also use air taps to interact with these buttons. So in this example right here, it has a button, but it also has a tooltip that says, say, adjust. So this voice command adjust, when you say that, has the same function as pressing on this button. So there's more than one ways to skin a cat, skin a horse. English is my first language. <laughs> And I'm not very good at it. So when you have all of these robust sensors, it's important not to rely on a single one of them. So to you, you really have to emphasize making your app a little bit more accessible and as diverse as, as diversely controlled as possible. So as AR devices become more accessible, we're, we're moving away from people who are sitting in an office and can dedicate uh, all of their their attention to operating a PC. So maybe you'll be driving and taking something out of your trunk. Like maybe maybe you just picked up groceries and you have a little baby and it's like screaming and puking in your arms and and you have to like muscle all these groceries out because you only take one trip and and you have this Hololens device and like you're you're fully at capacity. So you have to use other means of interacting with computer interfaces. So as, as your app has, or your app has to be able to be controlled through all these different sensors. So users have a ton of bandwidth to express themselves with the HoloLens. And it's up to you as a designer and developer to utilize all of that expression and capture that attention in the user. So because your user has this bandwidth, your app needs to express back with the same bandwidth. So every single one of those interactions comes with a different sensor. It has to have, or it has to express a different type of feedback to the user. If you're selecting with your eyes, that feedback needs to be different from if you're selecting with a touch, with a, with a finger tracking. If and, and what this means, it, it means using different sounds, it means using different colors, it means using different um, navigation states. It's almost like, or, or even animation. So it's almost like um, information overload or feedback overload to your user. You need to be constantly communicating with your user about which sensors that you are picking. So everything that the device understands about the world you need to confirm to the user that you understand that and that you can utilize that information. So it's doubly important now with new technology that reminds them all about the new capabilities. Like, like when, when smartphones were first introduced, um, we didn't know how to swipe. We had no idea that we could swipe on a screen. So we had to be taught these new abilities. So in that same sense, you need to teach people how to use their entire bodies for expressing themselves with this HoloLens device. Make sense? Like uh, Eric on the team here, um, he was one of the people that uh, was on the Microsoft team about designing one of the uh, apps for teaching people how to use hand gestures on the HoloLens. And it's this, this lovely magical hummingbird um, and so it taught people that if you hold your, your palm up, a hummingbird, this digital hummingbird, will come and like sit on your hand. So we can teach people in different ways and start designing about that, uh, or designing around that, about how to teach people to use their hands. Making sense? Of course it does. Yep, yep. Yep, yep. Zachary, why does that sound familiar? <laughs> so the thing that you have to understand, uh, again, about the HoloLens is that it's a relatively low powered computer. It has a mobile processor, it has low RAM, so it can't do a lot of onboard and everything is draining the battery, right? 
So you need to think about using the sensors on the HoloLens to power computing that's happening in other places. One of these things is called cloud rendering using um, Azure services. So you can render maybe an entirely complete architectural rendering of that's, that's just sort of exploding with cross, sec cross sections and details onto every sort of rivet of steel. You can, you can render that using Azure services and just stream that to the headset and then what you have is you have this high fidelity uh, 3D object that you're seeing through the HoloLens and the HoloLens isn't actually computing that. It's not computing the, the triangles, it's just seeing something. And that leaves the, the device free to do uh, whichever applications that you want to see. Um, and that is with your cloud rendering. Now, one of the things that um, Microsoft and Bing is actually doing is that Bing has a digital twin of the world. And what do, we, what do we mean by a digital twin? It means that there's a digital um, replication of something that is real. So it has a digital twin of Los Angeles and all of its buildings. Um, kind of like, what was that? GTA, except better. <laughs> and with less violence. <laughs> so Bing has this digital twin of the entire world and it's this map sort of integration. So what you could actually do is you could use that digital twin, use cloud rendering to stream all of these images to your HoloLens and see what's happening or what, what maybe Venice looks like outside of your window. Super, super cool. And then of course you have your data service visualizations and your cloud point rendering and all that lovely, lovely stuff. So with all of that in accordance and, and sort of taken into mind, we are gonna dive right into the technical portion of the workshop. We are gonna dive into Space Invaders. Now, for those of you who are uh, just new to Unity and um, yeah, it looks like, okay, we got a good, we got a good distribution here we will dive right into the Unity portion. Now, I already have a project set up. It is right here. Now, this, this project, this is just um, a regular 3D template. And what that looks like here, if you were following along, is it just looks like, boom, with your Unity Hub, you can just click on New. And I'm using a 2019.4.4. Now, very important to note, we will be using MRTK as the toolkit here. So what is MRTK? It's a cross-platform toolkit that lets you develop for uh, AR or for VR. You could actually use MRTK to make a Quest application. But today we'll be doing HoloLens. So I'm using 2019.4.4. And because I'm using 2019.4.4, I'm going to use a different package of MRTK. And before we get started using that, there are a number of things that we need to make sure that we have installed on our computer, Computadora. What you need to do, first things first, is you need Windows 10. If you're using a Mac, I am sorry to say, I'm not, I'm actually not sorry to say, just get a Mac. I mean, not, not get a Mac, just get a PC. <laughs> Because you will need it. Or if you are using a PC, you can just use Boot Camp and have a um, Windows computer side by side. Now, the next thing that you need is you need a Visual Studio, either tw or, uh, 2019, 16.2, or higher. Now, there is a known issue with uh, Visual Studio 2019, 16.2. Two, and that has to do with the compile issue with the architecture. And I'll explain this a little bit later on when we actually launch to this device and see what's working. The other thing that you need is you need the Windows 10 SDK. If you don't have this downloaded and installed on your computer, assuming that your computer is in developer mode, that is a muy, muy importante. You need your computer in developer mode to use your Windows 10 SDK. The next thing that you need is you either need an emulator or the device itself. Those are the tools that you need. So we'll be using MRTK. So the first thing, 
because I mentioned that I'm using 2019 version of Unity, you will need, you will need in this GitHub uh, repo right here, you'll need to get a certain package, but this package right here will be different. For 2019 versions of Unity, you need a package called the Microsoft Mixed Reality Toolkit 2.4. If you're using 29 or 2020 versions of Unity, you will need 2.5. Now the foundation is what you want to import into your Unity project. Now I've already done that because it takes a bit of a time. And to save time and to leave space for your, all of your questions, your lovely questions, I've already imported this. But if you don't know how to do that, it's in your assets and import package and import your custom package. And then you click on that foundation right there. Now you can do your examples, which will have uh, a number of things for your UI examples, like your button presses, all those lovely things. It's not necessary, but you can use it as a, as a benchmark. And since I've already have that here, we have that MRTK and we have the core and the SDK that Kyle has mentioned. So, 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 what else are we going to do? Now, if you're if you're a little confused right now, don't don't be afraid, young Padawan. Uh, a GitHub repository uh, will be provided for you guys after this workshop, so you can fiddle around with what I've done. Uh, maybe even grab that robot sphere that we're going to be we're going to be using to you know pinch pinch to destroy. So I have the mixed reality toolkit here already, all set up and ready. So the moment that you import your mixed reality toolkit, you will be prompted with this window. Now what this window does is it configures your Unity project to use MRTK and to configure things for your HoloLens. So that's what we'll be doing next. We're gonna go into our build settings and make sure that these are all set up and ready to go. So we're gonna to go to file and build settings. Now, right now, we are in the PC Mac and Linux standalone. And since that's not what we were building for, we're actually gonna to switch to the universal Windows platform because that's what we're using. So we have the target device is not going to be any device. It's a very specific thing. We're going to be using a HoloLens device. Now, that architecture that I mentioned, it's not going to be x64, it's actually going to be ARM64. Now we have the build type is D3D, this is important, and your minimum platform version right here, this will come from your Windows SDK that you downloaded and installed, and, and a very important and, your build configuration must be released. You don't want debug. You got no debug, no bugs there. Bugs are gross. And we squish them, maybe. Unless you like bugs, then I'm really, really sorry, but I do not like bugs. Gross. Anyways, your build configuration must be released and your compression method right here can just be default. And then we're going to switch platform. And when we do that, oh, has it switched yet? Oh, it's thinking, it's thinking. So um, I have recently found out that uh, ketchup is now going to be resuming production in Canada. And I was like, well, why did it stop in the first place? Stopping production in Canada was probably not a great idea in hindsight. I'll just give you guys some time to catch up to that one. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we are greeted with this project configurator again. And what we want to do is we want to, we don't really want to think too much. You know what, let's just say apply all. And it's great. So we have switched over. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the player settings. 
And because this is a 2019 version of Unity, we will have that lovely XR settings in our player settings, which is right here. So in our player settings, right in the XR settings here, we have VR supported. We wanna make sure that this is checked. And our virtual SDKs, we have none there. We have to add Windows SDK into this list. Otherwise, it will not launch to the device. So click on that plus icon and add Windows Mixed Reality. Now, if you are using 2020 versions of Unity, you will have to go through the XR plugin management. And through the XR plugin management, install your Windows Mixed Reality SDK. Same, same, but different. You can have an audio spatializer, spatula, your audio spatula. I'm just gonna call it that. You know, slap some audio onto your ears. Apply. And then the other thing that we need to make sure is configured is that the depth format here is not 24, but 16. And that has to do with how color is rendered on your HoloLens. It can only handle the 16-bit depth. And that's just how the waveguides work. <laughs> Especially Joy Thor. Yes. <laughs> so we have the player settings, and we have our Windows uh, mixed reality there. And that's all great and lovely. Now we can close this. And, and a very important hand, in our build settings, we need a scene to build. So you know what? Let's add the open scene right now. I have already created a scene. We can see it right here in Space Invaders. Add open scenes. And now when we build this thing, eventually we will have the scene, Space Invaders. And the next thing that we have to do, because our build settings are all good to go, Speechy Keen, we have to configure the scene. Now we don't have to go right click and like do all things ourselves because the Mixed Reality Toolkit has this lovely little thing called Add to Scene and Configure. So we're gonna click on that. And right away we have two things created. We have the Windows Mixed Reality Toolkit there and the Mixed Reality Play Space. Now your Mixed Reality Play Space, this looks a little familiar for anyone who has done AR Foundations, which you actually could use AR Foundations on your HoloLens, but you don't wanna do that because there is exponentially less capabilities when you use AR Foundations on the HoloLens as opposed to Windows Mixed Reality Toolkit. So, if you've done AR Foundations, this looks a little familiar uh, with your AR Session and AR Session Origin. We have the Windows or the Mixed Reality Play Space, which has your camera. And then we have the Mixed Reality, mixed reality Toolkit here. So your Mixed Reality Toolkit, this is where you're going to configure your hand tracking, your um, voice commands, your uh, spatial awareness, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, with these configurations, you actually have to clone them. Anything that you want to fiddle with, fiddle with in the Mixed Reality Toolkit, you have to clone. And this is sort of a um, safety thing because how many people have fiddled with something to the point of no return and it no longer works and you can't undo? There is no undo. It is a very, very sad and panicky moment. So to solve that and to save you from yourself, Windows has this lovely clone button. So we're gonna clone this, and we're gonna start fiddling with this configuration profile because that is the first thing that we need to tackle. I'm gonna click on clone. And let's say, I'm gonna rename this to Space Invaders Toolkit Configuration Profile. I'm just gonna copy that and click on clone. And there is my configuration profile. And now I can actually select that and actually select a HoloLens 2 default configuration profile as well. Now I can also clone that and you know what? We can do like Space Invaders HoloLens 2. We can switch around to these different things. Now the next thing that I'm going to do because I want to use some, and I'll show you a little trick. And this is for your iteration. I'll show you just a tiny little trick. 
we're going to do your spatial awareness. Now, we have to enable spatial awareness in the first place. And your spatial awareness system is the thing that um, maps your environment and, and um, uses your IR sensors on the HoloLens to actually know like where your planes are, to actually know where your walls are and, and all of the stuff. is how the HoloLens understands the world, is through its spatial awareness system. So we're going to enable that and to start fiddling with it, we are going to click on clone and do that. And clone, like Star Wars Clone Wars. <laughs> now, in order to have a spatial awareness system, you also need something called a spatial uh, or a spatial mesh observer. Now, right now, this Windows Mixed Reality Spatial Mesh Observer is an observer for your HoloLens. But there is a trick for you to play in the editor and have spatial awareness simulated. And I'm going to show you how. I'm going to add a spatial awareness observer. And this new data provider right here, this type, this none, is going to be your spatial mesh observer and your spatial object mesh observer. That's the thing that's going to be simulating a spatial mesh in the editor, which will be good for iteration and for using a whole bunch of different things. Now, sometimes you'll get this pesky little error right here, and we can actually just click on clear and it'll disappear. That is a known issue that MRTK is currently going to solve in the next iteration. Now, the next thing that we want to clone is actually the input. Now, the input system um, controls your input actions that you will need to map certain voice commands and your gestures and your speech and your hand tracking. So we're going to clone this system. Clone. And, and Space Invaders. And let's do clone. And we're going to use our hand tracking. So we're going to clone this. And so you'll see that, uh, well, you, if you want everything, you want to fiddle around with everything because you're so curious, um, just clone everything. Everything. So in our, our hand tracking, we have certain prefabs that we're going to see. So right now we have the hand mesh visualization modes because I like to see the hand mesh and see where things are. I am going to click on everything. So it'll play in the editor and on your player. And I don't really want to see this, so I'm going to say nothing. I don't like to see the joint stuff. Or maybe you guys do, but mm, I like the mesh. OK, so that is all set up now. There is a very important lesson for all of you gamers out there, specifically Nintendo gamers. Raise of hands in the chat, or thumbs up in the chat. Who loves, who loves some Nintendo? I'm waiting. Nice. Nice. Who's excited for Breath of the Wild 2? Or Hyrule Warriors? Yes! Cool. So, what have we learned from Nintendo? Oh, there's the puppy. We have learned rule numero uno of everything that we should do in life. <laughs> yes, game, play. <laughs> rule numero uno of the life, the universe, death, love, everything. Everything not saved will be lost. So save your scene, save your Unity project. See this little asterisk? Give you a little, a little shortcut, control or command S, and you're gonna save your scene. Because now, if Unity potentially crashes or the universe ends, you would have saved it somewhere. <laughs> Excuse me. The castle is a layer, as you can see. So we have the Space Invaders, and now we actually need to create some content for this. 
we got to create some content. Now, what I like to do is I like to create a empty game object. I'm going to right click in the hierarchy. And for those of you who don't know what the hierarchy is, the hierarchy is basically just a list of things that um, is whatever is living in your world, in your scene. Your scene view is what you are constructing in the digital world. And in our case, be a mix of digital and real. So I'm going to create a empty game object and I'm going to call this my scene content because our scene content will be, you know, whatever is in the scene. Uh, so under scene content, I'm going to have another game object and this game object will, it's, it's only purpose is to spawn enemies that we are going to pinch to destroy. And also save for that asterisk right there. Now, before we move on, we are going to create a script called Spawn Enemies. Well, I already have it here, so I'm just going to attach it to. What am I going to attach it to? If a game object and a script are the same name, that means this script has to be on that game object. Boom. There we go. Now, the prefabs that we are going to spawn, that is my robot sphere, right? Here. So it is a prefab right there. So I can double click to open that up. Now then on this prefab, let's take a look at this thing. It's a lovely little asset from the asset store, which is in this tab right here. And they're actually having a pretty big sale. So try not to spend too much money. Oh, focus. <laughs> Squirrel. Um, so we have the robot sphere. And let's take a look at some of its animations. Let's look at this animation. So if, if we have this animation, we see that it is opening there. And then it closes if it's played in reverse. So, it, it, cool. So when this thing spawns, it's going to open up if it hits a large impact on the floor. And I'll show you how I did that. Now, to do a little trickery on this thing, but first let's explain, uh, there's a collider on this thing and a collider means that it will uh, detect any sort of collision with a digital object. So these things are going to be spawning in the real world. So what digital thing is it actually going to hit? That wasn't a rhetorical question. <laughs> what digital thing is it going to hit? It's a wall, it's a plane, it's the floor. Correct. So how does the headset digitize the floor, or the plane, or the windows to the wall? Exactly, spatial mapping. Because we fiddle around with the spatial mapper and the spatial awareness system, this robot sphere uh, because it has a rigid body and a collider on this thing, it's going to hit the world and be spatially aware. Now, there is a rigid body on this thing that is using gravity, so it will fall. And so let's take a look at the other things that are on this. Now, the first thing that we need to note is that it has an object manipulator script on it. This comes from MRTK. And what this does is that it allows and enables you to use your hands to pinch and, and uh, manipulate it. So a manipulation gesture is if you pinch it with two hands and you sort of like wiggle it around and everything. Navigation is your one pinch, um, and then moving it around. Air tap is just tap, and that's it. Now your object manipulator, you can select what kind of manipulation you want on this thing. Now we have to allow far manipulation. So that means we are focusing on this game object and our hand is focusing on it and we are pinching. That is what's going to happen on manipulation started. Now these are events that, uh, events that you can assign a public function to or a public method. And then it also has an audio source so that if eventually you want some sort of like explosion, 
um, you'll be able to play that sound a little bit later on. But that is for you guys to fiddle with uh, once you have this GitHub repo. So we have the audio source and then we have this manipulation event. Now, the robot controller, let's open up that script and we'll see what that happens there. And you'll notice in this robot sphere, we have Ah, there we go. There it is. So you'll notice in the hierarchy, what makes up this game object is two different things. It has your main game object, which is the body. It has this body here. So if I toggle this on and off, boop, 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 that is the game object there. So if I turn this off and I turn this big explosion on and play, we have, oh, let's turn off those gizmos. There we go. And then play. We have an explosion because guess what's going to happen when we destroy this thing? It'll explode, which is super cool. So let's turn that off, turn main on again. And then let's take a look at how we're doing that. So on enable. So when this thing is actually in the scene, it's going to uh, play that open and in so it'll emerge from its little ball and open up and then what it's going to do is it has that target transform which will be the main camera as we see the target is set to the main camera dot main dot game object and then in an update loop which is you know every frame it runs so what this thing is doing is that it's going to look at your target transform uh, it's normalized vector actually. And then it's just going to play the walking and nim and walk towards, walk towards in the transform.translate, walk towards the target. So it'll be moving towards the headset. And now we have that on collision enter. So if the magnitude of collision that it has on the floor is greater than 0 0.5, on ground will be true, and that'll give its cue to open up and start walking to the target. And then we have this public void destroy robot. So what this is doing is it's switching from the game object to that uh, explosion game object, and then destroying the game object that this thing is on already, which is just the Robert or the <laughs> Robert, Bobbert, uh, robot controller. And that's all that's doing. Now, there's a reason why this is a public method. It's public because if it is private, I won't be able to assign it in the manipulation events. So that public void destroy robot is started here. So the moment I pinch this thing, it's going to switch from the main body to the big explosion. Like so. Making sense? Yep. Cool. 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 So this is the prefab that we are going to spawn into the scene. Now we have a spawn enemies game object that has that spawn enemies script. Now this script is in complete. And there's a number of different ways that we can use a um, sort of pseudo random generation of this thing. Now, what I'm going to show you guys here is how just like a random direction, random vector three in a certain direction, and uh, a raycast. So in order for us to, to sort of have a repeating timed function, this is going to be something called a Coroutine. It's going to be in something called a coroutine. And the way we declare something like that is a private I E numerator. And you know what? Let's call this a timed ray cast. Now, this uh, enumerator, I am just going to copy it from here and then I'll just run it by you guys. Does anybody know what a ray cast is in this workshop? If you uh, if you don't know what a raycast is, 
<laughs> it's how the lights are taking. Yes. Because we have time, it's gonna do it. So we have, we have, let's say we have the ground here. And we have your person right here. Actually, let's put this person here. We have a person here. Yay! And they are wearing a HoloLens. <laughs> yes. The Hol oh, that was not the right one. Okay. Let's not do that. But there we go. I'm going to do it there. Nope. Anyways. <laughs> Exactly. It's beautiful. <laughs> so what we're going to do is we are going to raycast from the hollow lens in a random direction. It could be there. It could be there. It could be. And the all of these things are coming from the center of this game object. It could be there. It could be there. It could be there. It could be maybe there. Or maybe there. And a raycast is basically just like a little laser as... Uh, Chris has said, exactly. We're gonna ray cast to a certain object. And we're gonna hit a certain object. So we have a direction that we are pointing in right there. And we have a starting point and we have a direction. And then what we need is we need to save all the information of the thing that we hit, which in this case, will be okay. that, 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 a wall. Or whatever the spatial mapper is mapping. And that's what we're going to do up here. And that is what this thing is going to do. Now I have some um, errors here. And that is because I don't yet know what the main camera is. I have to declare this main camera. And you know what? Let's just do a public camera called main camera. And that'll be fine. So I can just drag and drop it there. Or I could actually get it, depending. But let's just drag and drop. And then what I need is I need a public game object called the enemy prefab. I need a reference to that sphere that we're going to, or that robot sphere that we're going to. Uh, Swap. And then you know what I'm going to have? I'm going to have a private int called index. I'll show you why. So in this star function, or actually before we do that, we need one thing. We need to spawn the thing in the first place. So you know what? Let's create a method that spawns the thing. And so you know what? Let's have it be like a public void. Let's just, there it is. So we could do that. Or actually, we don't necessarily need to do that one. But we do need a, a uh, let's do this one. Let's do that. So instantiate the enemy prefab. Did I spell that right? There we go. There it is. So your enemy prefab, we're spawning the thing, and it, we're passing in a position, a vector 3. And that vector 3 is that hit point from our raycast. Our raycast is coming from the main camera position in a random direction. So you know what? Let's create a random direction method. And let's do that right about here. We'll have a private, ah, uh, what are we gonna do? Private vector three. This would be random direction. Now we have to return a random direction. So you know what? We'll have a return a new vector three. And so this is where that pseudo random comes in. We'll have a random dot range between like zero and one. And that'll be our X. And then we'll have a random dot range. And you know what? Let's have it be like uh, from the camera's Y position up a little bit. So there's a random range from like 0 0.5 and your uh, main camera position dot Y plus about four in the up direction. And then we'll also have a Z random dot range from like zero to one. There we go. 
Yes, that is for efficiency sake, but that's not really what we're into right now. And we actually don't need this index. So now that we have a timed ray cast that is going to pick a random direction that we're going to spawn the thing, we, here we're going to spawn the thing. And this will instantiate the enemy prefab at a certain position right here and at a different rotation because the rotation is being uh, handled by your robot controller. It's turning to face the camera. So the next thing that we actually have to do is, we actually don't need this update. Boop, boop, boop. And you can dissect this, this piece of code a little bit later on. But now what we have to do is we have to start the timed recap. So start the coroutine timed recast. Like so. And so if all goes well, let's see here. And so we need that main camera reference, and this is under your main camera. Let's do there. And then we need a reference to the robot sphere, which is the thing that we will be instantiating. And then save. And then, and then, the moment that we have been waiting for. We'll see. We'll see. <clears throat> Clear. We're going to build it. But before we build it, let's throw this thing on and wake it up. And the great thing about uh, this, this headset, uh, because everyone who is wearing glasses or who has terrible eyesight, you can just flip it up. Oh, so cool. So let's build the thing. Edit, build settings, and we have that scene right there. And let's just go to build and make sure that that is released. We're going to create a new folder called builds and build it there. And then wait for it to build. And as it's building, I'm going to make sure that I am logged in. Now, what I'm going to do to show you guys what I'm seeing here. You won't see my pin. Hold on. There we go. Uh, it could be your USB device or your local. It doesn't really matter for here unless you're building and running. Um, but to actually do that, we're going to use Visual Studio instead. And then what I'm going to do to show you guys what I'm seeing is I am going to, I am going to, there we go, go to my Windows device portal. Now my Windows device portal, I am using uh, not USB connection, I'm using the IP address of this device right here. So that is 192.1, blah, 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 blah. You can see it in the, your in your network settings for this thing. And then uh, enable because it's not secure. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this live preview and we'll start to connect. Hey, there we go. And now you are seeing what I'm seeing. There we go. Cool. Now let's see if our build settings are here. So one of the uh, one of the things that I've been trying in like this whole quarantine COVID lockdown thing, oh, scary, um, is that I've been I've been diving into into cooking a lot, you know, as as people do. I'm not baking, I'm just cooking. But I was cooking uh, I was cooking this nice like lentil pasta the other day, and you know, I was thinking I was thinking like you know what, what if these noodles are fake, fake like a fake noodle? Well, then it would be an impasta. <laughs> no, right? Right? <laughs> right? Exactly.
and there's been like a lot of talk about about you know how schools are doing but did you guys hear about the kidnapping at school it worked out because he was he woke up <laughs> All the time, all the time. Sometimes it takes a long time to build, sometimes it doesn't. I'll take this thing off. Just make sure that it is on. Theoretically, it should, as long as your architecture is the same for your HoloLens first generation. Now, I believe it's something like, oh, geez, is it x86? I'll have to double check that. But theoretically, yes. Your, your build settings will be a little bit different. Um, but everything else should work. Like, MRTK should be fine. Let's see, let's see, yes. Then, then yes, you just need to switch your architecture. My, uh, my PC is being a little, a little, uh, a little slow today. Maybe it's because of the million projects that I have open up. Kind of like all the tabs in my brain. There was, um, you know, you know, when you like need a new hobby or like if you're bored, you could, you could actually try something really, really fun. You could try blindfold archery because then you don't know what you're missing. I have yet to try it. <laughs> exactly. The target. But you know who wouldn't be missing a target? Vuforia with the HoloLens. Is anyone here from uh, East Coast, the East Coast of Canada? Okay, how about the West Coast? I, I took a, ro a recent road trip to the West Coast in BC and I was, I was very close to like the ocean and everything. And I was like, you know what, I think the ocean is salty because beaches don't wave back. <laughs> okay, so finally we got the builds. Now here's where here's where the the funny thing comes in. I'm gonna throw this thing on again. And we have the HoloLens up and running. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. So what we're going to do is we need to open up the solution in Visual Studio and open with Visual Studio. And it'll create this solution. Now what you want, because in our build settings, we did not select debug. Debug will actually ruin your performance on the HoloLens. You're going to Click on that, and you're going to go to Release. And it's not the ARM architecture that we have. What was the architecture we selected in our build settings? Three, two, one. Say it in the chat. What was the architecture in the build settings? 
is uh, 10 points for Griffin. <laughs> That's all right. It is arm 64. Yes. <laughs> yes. Command us. Now we're not using a remote machine, otherwise we would just have like the IP address on this HoloLens, which we could do, but because mine is connected by USB, I'm gonna click on this and go to device and a very important next, we're gonna go to debug and we're going to start without debugging. Now what this will do is it will launch or build and launch onto the headset. So if all goes well and everything was correct, which I'm praying to the demo gods that they are, it will launch without a hitch and you'll be able to see it on the HoloLens itself. I'm gonna start without debugging and head over to the Windows device portal, click on the live preview. And then let's see how this thing's going to do. Let's see how it's doing. You know, sometimes like I don't I don't eat meat so much anymore. But you know what I was thinking? Like I was thinking that if I am so irritated with people, I be in the same room as a cannibal because they are fed up with people. Exactly. So with this sort of iteration thing, now we didn't say in the editor itself, but there is a way that we could do this. But since it's already building, you can see how uh, iteration within Unity would be a very nice thing to do because building actually takes quite a long time. But it's a good thing that um, the Visual Studio solution and the HoloLens 2 is uh, separate. So we could actually just test this right here. Hopefully. Let's see if this is doing. All right. Well, let's hit play and see what happens. And there it is. So this spatial awareness system. Because we have that spatial object mesh observer, we have that here. So let's move forward. And we see that a robot has been spawned. So I have to find it. Where did it go? Where is that thing? Where is it? Oh, there's been a number of things. Ah, there it is. OK. So to test, we have the hand. And there we go. Boom, so that works. So theoretically, when this builds, it shall, it shall work. So I'm not much of a coffee drinker anymore, but I do drink tea. You know what I was thinking? Like, what kind of tea, what kind of tea do rich people drink? Oh, here it goes. Build succeeded. Where is live preview? Let's do yes. And then let's do yes. So you can see my fingers. Now then I have to see. I have to find them. Where are they? Where are they? Let's unplug this. And then let's see. Let's walk around. Ah, there it is. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay. There we go. There's one, and boom. <laughs> 
Ah, and there's another one, and there's another one. Okay. Boom! Boom! I pinch, and they pinch. There we go, and there we have it. Your very first Space Invaders. You know what, this is like real cool. And there's a pop. Go! Ah, and there we go. And there you have it, building space invaders on your HoloLens. Plug this thing in. And thus concludes your Unity technical portion of this workshop. I hope you had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. It's so cool. <laughs> and I'll pass it off back to uh, Kyle to finish things off. Okay, as he's doing it, I'll just, uh, you know, sit tight. Oh yeah, it is super cool. Super, super cool. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I didn't, I didn't finish that. Sorry, what you didn't watch people drink? Yeah, but you never finished Property. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's enough. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. They're legendary. I was talking them up all all stream long. So I'm gonna remove your stream, uh, your stream there, Nikisa. I'm gonna take over with my own. Give me one quick second. Um, can everybody hear me still? Everybody can see me. We're all we're all good on that front. Just give me a thumbs up in the chat, please, if you can. Awesome. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Alberto. Much appreciated. Um, Nikisa, as always, pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you really never fail to impress. Uh, I can see there have been a couple of questions asked throughout the presentation. I want to make sure that we do have time to address them all. We are coming up on the end of our allotted time for today. I'm just going to take a few minutes to wrap things up here um, before we do the Q&A session of this afternoon's event. Um, I have added a poll to the chat as well. So please, everybody in attendance, take the take a minute to navigate over there. Um, it really helps us as we look to improve the workshops that we do offer and create new ones. So on a scale of one to 10, would you recommend this workshop? Uh, moving on though, with the presentation, let's advance here. I love sharing this slide here today as it's really an opportunity for us to brag about all of the cool things that people who have taken our course have gone on to do. Um, you know, no matter who you are, what your current skill set is, we can help you with your XR journey. Um, as you can see, some of our students have gone on to do some pretty amazing things. In fact, uh, I, I was peeking in the in the back to see who's in attendance today. I think Mike Oaks is actually here with us this afternoon. So Mike, great to see you. Thanks for coming out. Uh, hope the new job at Unity is going super well. Um, and Wayne knows Mike personally, so they, there you go. Um, Mike actually took our 10-week course uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and he's clearly gone on to do amazing things. He's now a software engineer with Unity. Um, Jennifer's story is one that I love to share as well. She actually took our XR development with Unity course just this year, I think in May or in July. She recently got admitted to the Oculus Launchpad program to continue her training and education there and also seek some funding around the prototype that she built with us in our course. Matt DeLallo is an awesome story as well. He actually built his very own XR design studio um, so super exciting for him and love to see all the amazing things that he's done. Now, just mentioned the course a couple times there. Again, it's the flagship program that we have to offer here at CircuitStream, designed to teach you how to build your own VR and AR experience from scratch using the Unity engine. Everything's taught live just like today and online. Uh, you know, no classrooms, even pre-COVID, we've been, we've been doing this online for years. It includes 40 hours of education taught over that 10 week time span. It also includes 10 hours of one-on-one -on -one appointments, which are super helpful if you've got an idea that you'd like to build. We would love to help you bring your very own project idea to life. 
The course tuition fee here is $3,950. And I've mentioned previously, the next cohort gets started on December 1st. Sit tight though, as this is definitely included in the Black Friday deal that we do have ongoing, which I'll speak about in just a minute. Um, again, it's all about making your own VR and AR app within Unity. We do cover the fundamentals of the c -sharp programming language, three hours of class plus one hour of one-to-one -one time per week for 10 weeks. No experience is required. Beginners have no fear. If you're listening to me talk about our beginner-friendly 10-week course and all you're thinking to yourself is, hey, Kyle, hey, Nikisa, I'm already proficient in Unity and in C-sharp, but the puns are legendary. The teaching skills are legendary. I, I, I have to. I must continue my learning with CircuitStream. Well, you know, first of all, thank you very much. We, uh, we try our best and, um, you know, all that fun stuff. I'm very flattered. Uh, but we should definitely chat after the webinar. Second of all, don't worry, we got you covered. We do have another program that might be a better fit. It's called the XR Project Accelerator. It's an eight-week course. It's got labs to continue your applied learning in a, for the more intermediate or advanced crowd. But the real star of the show here is just the sheer amount of one-on-one -on -one support that's included in the program. Each student gets three hours of weekly one-on-one -on -one appointments where we can really focus on you your project and what you're interested in working on to take that prototype to the next level. Again, the course fee for this program is normally $4,450. Um, the next cohort is going to start on January the 5th. This program is also included in the Black Friday deal. Now, for both the 10-week XR development with Unity course and the 8-week XR project accelerator course, we do offer payment plans of three, six, or 12 months. So please feel free to take advantage of one of those if you'd like to enter, enroll in either of these programs. Now, one of the things that I haven't mentioned very much today is our team training catalog. If your organization is making a commitment to building VR or AR apps uh, today or in the near future, and would like to send a group of team members into the programs that we offer, we can definitely help and we would love to do so. We do have a catalog of programs that we offer to teams in private sessions. The interesting thing to note here about our team training is that we can be flexible on the content taught to meet your specific learning needs. In other words, we can create something custom from scratch if what we already offer doesn't align with your learning goals. We can also offer these training sessions with the Unreal Engine as well, if that's what's of interest. I've mentioned this before, um, but I thought I'd mention it again here. We do have new individual courses that vary in length, you know, delivery and content coverage. These topics include you know, things from XR development with the Unreal Engine, the foundations of developing XR art, you know, introduction to XR design and more. All of these individual courses launch in January. Registration is open today. Again, here's a list of these short courses. All of these are up on our website as well. So if you're interested in something specifically, please feel free to navigate there. I'll put a couple links um, up on the presentation here in a minute. And I think my team who's supporting uh, me behind the scenes today can also put up a, a little window there. So definitely feel free to click through there if you're interested. Okay, on to the fun stuff. Uh, I mentioned before Nikisa's presentation and again, just a moment ago, that we launched our Black Friday sale today. So this is all active. Feel free to take advantage. Uh, this offer extends all the way until Monday, November the 30th. Um, the first offer is the one that's up on the screen now. It's totally awesome. We call it the VR Starter Pack. This bundle includes admission to our 10-week XR development with Unity course. That's the 10-week program. Uh, it also includes complimentary admission to our upcoming C-sharp scripting fundamentals short course and we will man you a brand new Oculus Quest 2. As you can see on the screen here, total value of this package is somewhere in the neighborhood of $4,500. We are offering this bundle for $3,000 all in, and the payment plans that I mentioned are also available. This is the second pack, same idea, except we're calling it the Advanced XR pack. Uh, it's very similar to the first one, but it's you know, targeting the more intermediate or advanced folks in the room today. This bundle includes access to the January 5th XR Project Accelerator course, in addition, again, to the c -sharp Scripting Fundamental Short Course, and of Quest, uh, <laughs> that's funny, of course, you get a Quest, 
you get a quest and you get a quest too. Um, this package goes for $3,500. And once again, payment plans are available here as well. Um, I love this one too. In my opinion, we should have called this bundle the you know best sale because it covers literally everything else, anything that you're interested in. Um, if one of the previous two bundles isn't for you, uh, but you're definitely interested in continuing your learning with us, please feel free to take 30% off of any of the programs we have available while this deal lasts. You've already met me, but I wanted to mention a couple of my colleagues here behind the scenes as well. I think Steph and Vlad are both in the chat here behind the scenes as well. So feel free to say hi, guys. Um, we run the admissions team here at CircuitStream. One of the things that's worth mentioning, I think, as well, we work a little bit differently than other companies out there uh, in that we're happy to meet with you to discuss your learning goals, your long-term objectives in the XR industry. So please don't hesitate to get in contact with any of the three of us. If you want to talk about your plans, our academic offerings, the workshops, the deal that we're offering as part of this Black Friday um, sale, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're all on LinkedIn. We've all got our emails as well. Uh, and you can definitely get in touch with us as we'd be happy to chat. Now, with all of that being said, let's bring or begin rather the Q&A session. Uh, so I'd like to invite Nikisa back up on stage here to address anything that hasn't already been answered within the chat. Uh, once again, as a reminder, please feel free to post your questions in the questions tab and we'll get right to them. Okay, Nikisa, there we are. All righty. All righty then. Yeah. Uh, Lay it on me. What are these questions? What are these questions? So I think there's a few in the chat. Uh, I did see in the chat as well, Alberto was asking, can we send the Quest to Europe? Uh, depending on the country, the short answer is as long as Oculus can ship a quest to your country, um, you know, fair game. Feel free to feel free to uh, take advantage of that. Looks like you're in Sweden. I believe that that's covered, though we will have to verify. Uh, moving on, though, um, what have we got here? Nikisa, does anything catch your eye? Ah, Zachary Ellis. I am in XR development with Unity Course and creating a Magic Leap. There it is. Does MRTK work with Magic Leap? I believe so. Um, yes, I do believe that the MRTK uh, SDK will, <laughs> MRTK SDK, um, will uh, be applicable for your Magic Leap headset as well. Awesome. 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 Yeah. Um, I, think that, I think there's only a couple more here. Um, Paul oh, Parkinson. Yeah, there you there go. Is. Okay. So, uh, HoloLens is well integrated with Azure Cloud Services, as you mentioned. Uh, any idea how often it is used with other vendors, cloud services, and so what area services? So you can use um, AWS, uh, uh, Amazon services with the HoloLens. Um, its integration is a little bit more uh, stuff that you have to jump through. So using Azure Cloud Services um, on a Microsoft product is probably your best bet. You'll have the smoothest transition, your smoothest rendering, and um, maybe more tutorials on how to do stuff too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Nikisa, I was sc scanning, part of me, English is hard today, through the questions tab. Oh, another one just came in from Alberta. So I will launch that one. I was going to say, I thought we were at the end there. So here it is. Are you planning to launch a training with Osher Anchor or Render? Oh, that's a really good question. Yes, we are. And we are also planning on launching a training, you, including using Azure Cognitive Services. So that will include your machine learning algorithms for um, maybe object detection, maybe speech. Um, bunch, bunch of lovely, lovely stuff coming down the pipelines there. And I'm super excited about it. Very fun. Very fun. I think that's the end. Uh, for anybody who's left in the audience here, if there's any more questions sort of at the last minute here, please feel free to paste them in the chat or the questions tab. Um, but I think, you know, without further without further ado, I think we're going to wrap up the session there unless there's any last minute questions again. Again, Black Friday deal is live. I think we've sent out some marketing communications on that front. It's all over the website. Feel free to get in touch with myself, with Steph, with Vlad. 
Um, we are doing an info session on this coming Monday to discuss the 10 week XR development with Unity course specifically. So if you're at all interested in that program and want to learn more, please feel free to attend that one totally free. I believe it's set for the same time as today's workshop. We've got um, same thing info session on the 3rd of December for the eight week XR project accelerator course. And we're always doing free workshops just like the one today. So feel free to head to the site, check them all out, get in touch with any of us. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for attending everyone. You're all going to get the recording. Nikisa's project assets sent in an email later on today as well. But yeah, that's it. That's all I got for you. Thanks so much for attending. Stay safe wherever you are. Have a great afternoon, evening, and uh, hopefully see you guys again soon. Bye-bye.